Well, hello everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Anabaptist Perspectives. I'm here with Stephen Russell. We're at Faith Builders um, up in Guys Mills, Pennsylvania. Um, you've written a book on non-resistance. You've been a teacher here for quite some time. You have a degree in church history. And there's, there's a, a doctrine of the Anabaptists that's probably one of the more famous ones, and it's non-resistance. Mm -hmm. Can you just, first of all, describe what do the Anabaptists mean when we use that term? Um, and just go into a little bit of that. So do you mean the early Anabaptists in the Reformation days? Yes. Okay. Yes. The word they actually used was, we are defenseless Christians. And uh, for them, the reason for using that particular word was all the other Christians were, were connected to the state. And so mm. if, uh, if, uh, if they found somebody who was heretical, they, they would judge them, and then they'd hand them over to the state, and the state would um, usually execute them. Wow. All right, so the Anabaptists have made it very clear, we believe in discipleship, mm -hmm. but we uh, do not use the arm of the state. We don't use the sword. So we're defenseless Christians. We don't defend ourselves. And if somebody mm. happens to have a, the wrong doctrinal view, they work with him, and if he, if he doesn't change, they may excommunicate him, but they will not use the sword. They are defenseless Christians. They, and they even tied together the concept of excommunication, mm -hmm. and they compared that with, yes, sometimes somebody needs to be disciplined uh, because mm -hmm. of his doctrine, but you don't kill them. So that was the key thing, mm -hmm. uh, because in, the, in uh, Reformation days, most people weren't drawn into the military. You came in on your own. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't as big a question then. It was more, do we use the state to discipline in the church? And no, we don't do that. And the whole reason was because of love. We mm -hmm. love our enemies. We don't, even if it's even mm -hmm. if it's a person in the church who falls away doctrinally and is corrupting, potentially corrupting the church, mm -hmm. the um, they would say, we may have to expel him, but we expel him and we try to treat him in a way that he may come back. We want him to come back. Interesting. Yeah. Okay, so basically, it's taking. It would be their interpretation of. Jesus' teaching of love your enemies. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my question is, where did this teaching come about? How did this happen? And, and specifically, where geographically did it originate? Ah, for, okay. for the Anabaptists. For the Anabaptists. Yeah. Okay. Well, the early church was non-resistant, resistant, mm -hmm. and it lost it. And so what you have is the medieval church just before the Reformation. Everyone believed in the just war theory that you may have to defend yourself. Okay. And, um, and then a man named Erasmus printed, published the Greek New Testament. Mm -hmm. And so everybody could look at the original source and see what Jesus said, what the apostles said. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they saw in here that we were called to do something beyond what we were allowed to do in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. We were actually supposed to lay our lives down and we were supposed to love our enemies that mm -hmm. way. And so they, um, one of the sources is Erasmus. The fact that he, mm -hmm. he, he published the Greek New Testament, and then they saw in the original source what Jesus called us to and what the, other, what the apostles called us to. And the, f the first time that we actually hear them putting, putting this into practice, there's, there's two important times. One is Conrad Grebel is moving towards uh, adult baptism. Mm. And he's writing to some other reformers and he makes it clear that the, we are to lay down the sword. The sword doesn't belong to the Christian. Mm. The next place it comes out, Clearly. So that would be about 1524. 1527, the Anabaptists write the first sh uh, confession of faith that they have. It's called Schleitheim. Mm. And there they make it very clear. Um, the Christian is to walk in the re life mm. of the resurrection, and he is to uh, live in the perfection of Christ, and the sword is not part of the perfection of Christ. God, mm. has, God has established the government to take care of those who are not walking in the perfection of Christ, and they have the sword. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, so and you mentioned this at the beginning, but you're saying the early church did have the non-resistant teachings. Yes. They lost that, mm -hmm. and then around the time of the Reformation, you see this revival coming back. Because they're yeah. looking back at the original documents. They're uh -huh. looking at the New Testament, and they're looking at it in Greek. And there were at least some places in the Vulgate, which is the Latin Bible they mm -hmm. were using before that, 
there were some places there that were mistranslated. So I don't know that there were any about the old, about the uh, non-resistance, mm -hmm. but for instance, when he started his ministry said, mm -hmm. well, in the, in the Greek it says, repent and uh, be baptized. Mm -hmm. And in the um, Vulgate it says, do penance. And you know, that's- Interesting, okay, so, so it had a little bit of a flavor uh, yeah, to it. Yeah, it had a little flavor that was mm -hmm. uh, definitely very Catholic. Mm -hmm. And that was one of those things that startled people as they started reading the Greek New Testament. And I think it mm -hmm. made them more pay attention. So what are we being called to? Things, yeah, yeah. It's like a, I, coming I back to God's word, what yeah. does it actually say? I don't know that the Vulgate had any uh, mistranslations on the issue of non-resistance, mm -hmm. but the whole thing was people, people realized that the church had slipped away hmm. from what was the original uh, call in the New Testament, and so they went back uh, mm -hmm. eagerly looking at what, yeah. do we, what should we do, how should we live. So the question is then, what other perspectives did the church have on mm -hmm. violence, on war? And you've already kind of touched on that, but, but where did those things come from? Yeah, well, the early Christians were both non-resistant and they also uh, were not willing to participate in government. And oh, I could okay. go into this really extensively, mm -hmm. but I, I don't think we would have mm -hmm. enough time. Mm -hmm. And, and um, as, as Con the first emperor came along who called himself a Christian, Constantine, mm -hmm. started a gradual moving together of church and state. And probably the most important person for shifting the, the church away from non-resistance and non-participation in the state is St. Augustine. Ah, uh, from it, the, which is on which, your board yeah, right here. I, you, I had a yeah. class on him. You're just teaching a class on that. Late, yeah. mm -hmm. late 300s, early 400s. And um, he is the person who takes, he takes a pagan writing. The pagans knew that war is not good. Interesting. And so okay. there's a, and, but they had to do it. Mm -hmm. So Cicero, a pagan around uh, 50 BC, wrote um, a theory of, ju of just war. And it had lots mm. and lots of restraints. Augustine takes that, and he, and he and, and these restraints are if you're gonna if you're gonna have a war, they're good. You know, <laughs> it's for instance, don't harm non-combatants, so, and mm -hmm. and so you go after the other soldiers, but don't harm old men, women, children, mm -hmm. and don't destroy livelihoods, don't destroy farms, etc. Mm -hmm. These are the kinds of things it said, and it, and um, Augustine added to it ideas to make it Christian. So we, if mm. you have to fight. You have to do it in love. Continuing on with that, you have you, so around the 400s, you have these ideas developing. Where does it go from? Two that? things happen there. Okay. Augustine uh, says that um, we 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 have to uh, defend the order, the social order. So at least sometimes uh -huh. we have to defend. Uh -huh. it's, it is a, it's meant to be defensive. It's uh -huh. meant to be defensive. It, this, it doesn't work out that way, but that's what it's meant to be. Uh -huh. And also. It, because of his change, it starts to make it look better if we actually are Christian and participate in the government. Now, let me tell you what they used to do. Um, up, right up to Augustine's time, mm -hmm. as, as more and more people became Christian, they start, some of them, especially in the upper class, started to think the Roman Empire keeps chaos at bay. Mm -hmm. So before I get baptized, I will serve the government, either in the military or in, in the government itself, and then at a, maybe when I'm 30 or 40, I will withdraw and get baptized. Okay. And, and this, okay, but the original pattern was not participating in the, in the military mm -hmm. or the government. And, but this is a big step in compromise, and then it, that doesn't last long. Sometime mm -hmm. soon after uh, Augustine's time, it becomes acceptable to be in the military and to be, um, mm. and to, and to be in the government. In fact, uh, while the emperors were still pagan, they, um, there's, there, there were some Christians in the army because sometimes some soldiers would hear the gospel and want to be baptized and they couldn't leave the army and the, and the church worked with them and said, if hmm. you promise not to kill, we will baptize you. But now if their, if their commander said, um, there's, a, there's a battle and you have to go and you refuse, you would be executed. So this is a oh. promise that you're, and, and it's a promise that puts your life mm. in the balance. The church did that because it, this was a pastoral need. There were some mm. soldiers who were turning to the Lord and couldn't get out of the military. But at the same time, when the a church did that, they also made it clear, this would be in the early 200s, they also made it clear, if you are in the government, mm. 
you and you and you have the uh, p potential of uh, judging a case that could be a capital case. You had to withdraw at mm -hmm. least for that. But mm -hmm. those people could leave. They could they could leave government. So essentially, mm -hmm. the church was saying, um, we don't want you in the government or in the or in the uh, military. Augustine is saying, well, but we have to to keep things um, functioning well, to keep the world functioning well, and then yeah. eventually it becomes just the norm. Mm -hmm. However, e during the whole of the mi Middle Ages, Christians still knew, I'm just using that word as people in the church, mm -hmm. they still knew that this wasn't really what God wanted. Mm -hmm. And so that during the Middle Ages, the church developed um, books that told priests how to deal with people that came to them in confession about, I was in the military. And, um, and so that it, was, it was accepted, but mm -hmm. they still knew it's not quite right. And so there were mm -hmm. rules. Did the man know that he had uh, um, stabbed someone, let's say? Did he know he had died? And did he, if he was an archer, then he didn't know if he hit anyone. Mm -hmm. and, and so there were a whole different set of rules depending on how well you were aware Whoa. of if you had actually killed someone or not. But they recognized there was something in them that said, uh, they heard the Gospels, and they knew this isn't really the best. So even though the church was allowing it and accepting the just mm -hmm. war, people were still not at ease. But there was one more development. Um, as Christianity and Islam came into contact with, the, with each other, Islam affected Christianity, and Islam with its jihad and its holy war, mm. it, it affected the Christians. And it's about 100 years after Islam comes on the scene that we have the first crusade. The first, it yeah. wasn't called a crusade, that's, a, that's years later, but the, we have the first time that the church tried to force people to become Christians militarily. Mm -hmm. Then a few, um, a few hundred years later, we have the first actual crusade to go conquer the land that, where Jesus lived, where mm -hmm. the Muslims had taken over. So now you, it's, you get grace if you go and fight for God. That's the crusade. Well, that, that's a totally different that, tone going on there. Totally, yeah. and it comes from Islam. Yeah. It comes from Islam. It's, it's like it's, it's very reactionary to yes. something. Yes. So this goes on. So you're saying the, these teachings started coming around the 400s. This goes on for quite some time mm -hmm. um, until around the Reformation time, I, I guess? Yes, and, and it, well, uh, the Crusades are a little bit before the Reformation. Mm -hmm. And then in the Reformation, as people are looking at the Scriptures and asking themselves, mm. where has the church made a mistake? People recognize that there are things that aren't quite what they should be. Yeah. They, they started seeing things like we, um, for, from our perspective, and I think from the biblical, biblical perspective, um, people are called to follow Jesus, and then they ask to be baptized. Not you baptize them as children. That was a big thing. <laughs> yeah. But then they yeah. also noticed other things like, um, should we be involved with the sword, whether mm -hmm. it's the state or whether it's the military? And, and so that, that, did, uh, mm -hmm. that is rediscovered in the, res in the uh, Reformation. So considering the many different views at the time, especially the cr strong connection that the church was having with the state. In the Reformation days. Yeah, in the Reformation days, why do you think the Anabaptists took such a strong stance on that? And, and how, did that, how did that go for them, basically? Well, they felt that so much had been added, and that's the problem in the church, and they wanted to get oh. back to the original. They wanted to be more biblical. Now, uh, and so that's what motivated them. I think there was another thing, and that was they were motivated to preach the gospel in a way that nobody else was mm. because everybody was baptized as a child. So all you need is to educate them. Help, yeah. You know, you don't have to call them to faith. Mm -hmm. the, the Lutherans baptized children, the Anglicans baptized children, the um, Reformed or the Calvinists baptized children, so did the Catholics. The Anabaptist said, no, each one has to make his decision. And then, so what they were mm. calling you to is a vision that God has, uh, that every, we, mm. all have, we all have a need and we all have to, mm. that's answered in Jesus, but this actually changes you and it makes you a person who's about mm. love, just like God's about love. So mm. it, it was an attempt to be biblical and it was an attempt to uh, preach the gospel. And as you preach the mm. gospel, you start to realize um, this is about loving your enemy hmm. more than loving yourself. Mm -hmm. So I think it was uh, both the recognition of God as love and uh, the recognition that the scriptures themselves make this clear. Mm -hmm. um, you, you heard that uh, we, you should love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say unto you. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they would read these things and, and they wanted to be as biblical as possible, but then they also saw their call to 
to evangelize, it meant they ought to be lovers rather than people that defended themselves or hated others. Hmm, yeah, so. yeah, that makes sense. And they were very willing to say, this is important enough. We're yep. going to really take a stand here. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Now we're shifting a little more to current day, but I guess you can answer this from the Reformation perspective as well. But are the Anabaptists unique in their commitment to peace and nonviolence? Uh, mm -hmm. And then how does how does their approach differ from other denominations? I guess I'm thinking of, you know, you have Bonhoeffer, Quakers, different people who, mm -hmm. who had peaceful... Um, yeah, just an answer some of that. How okay. is that how, what, what are the differences there? Um, the Anabaptists were the main group in the Reformation that mm -hmm. saw the need to um, be defenseless. That's the word they used. Okay. Okay, and mm. that, that, there may have been a few others, but that they're, they're the key. Now, there was a group among the Anabaptists who picked up the sword, the Munsterites. Mm -hmm. They felt that um, the time had come to, to stop being slaughtered like sheep, and so they picked the sword up. It was a very um, sad uh, um, event, and it was only a small group of Anabaptists, but most of them were non-resistant then. Um, there have been other mm -hmm. Christians throughout history who have been non-resistant. Mm -hmm. uh, ever since the Reformation, many Christians look to the Scriptures and try to shape their lives according to that. Mm -hmm. In the United States, um, there were the, um, ref uh, the uh, re Restorationist Christians, and the um, Pentecostal Christians, oh. both of whom looked at the scriptures and at the beginning turn, ten, uh, tended to be non-resistant. Hmm. Um, but it wasn't a, some, it wasn't a, I, I would say it wasn't well thought out. I think the Anabaptists did a better job of thinking mm -hmm. about it and how it's really uh, a core aspect of being a Christian. Mm -hmm. And so they saw it there, but um, they have lost it. Mm. Um, also, there are many Christians who would call themselves pacifists, and I would make a difference between a pacifist and a um, non-resistant Christian. Um, a, now, somebody might call himself a pacifist and actually mean somebody who will lay his life down rather than defend mm. himself. But often there have been Christians who see that war is not good, and they prefer to uh, try to avoid it, and so they often start passive, pacifistic um, organizations, mm -hmm. but historically, when when the when uh, this happened before before the Civil War, there were a lot of pacifist organizations. But the Civil War was for a good a good reason. Oh. So they so you have Quakers going into the military to free the slaves. Hmm. World War Two, uh, World War One, the same thing. There were a lot of pacifistic organizations, and just before the war, they were trying to get together and and call for peace. But once the war started, um, many of those people said, this is, a, this is a, a war and justice is on our side, and so we should fight it. Wow. So m the people that I'm thinking of as pacifists, yes, they see the evil of war, mm -hmm. but they uh, can at times be drawn into war. The non-resistant person is the one who will not even defend himself. He sees mm -hmm. the image of God in the other person, and rather than destroy that or damage it, he will let that person, if he wants to be my enemy, he will let that person kill him, but he won't. Uh, and pacifists often do not, will, will not go hmm. down that path. They wouldn't be quite that extreme, or extreme, or... Uh, yeah, they wouldn't be that yeah, thorough. That th yeah, yeah, thorough is a much better yeah. word, yeah. And then there's this other thing that's <clears throat> happening today. Uh, a lot of just war theory people are recognizing that with the kinds of weapons we have, Mm -hmm. nuclear weapons and things, <laughs> and, and, and uh, biological and chemical weapons, mm -hmm. that war may hurt a lot more people than it used to. And so there mm -hmm. are people who still believe in the just war theory, but are becoming very reticent about war. Mm -hmm. Really, we can hardly go to war. Now, that's not, that's not non-resistance. Mm -hmm. But I'm just saying that people that have a, a Christian outlook tend to... to um, if we, if, if to resist going to war, uh, many times they do, uh, but often feel like they have to. Right now, uh, a lot of people are seeing this is really something we should avoid. And I think we Anabaptists have a moment where we can be talking to our friends and helping them see the biblical, mm. the godly approach. They're starting to question, can we really have a just war? Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think we need to understand our own position and, and start helping our friends, whether they're Baptists or whatever they are, to see mm -hmm. that this is really very scriptural 
and it's it's what God wants from us. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, <laughs> wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us for this episode, mm -hmm. and especially for the time you've put in to study this out and to teach this to others. I think that's really powerful, and, and we need more of that. So thank I appreciate you. that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm.